Well, if you have your scriptures, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1. We're going to read a larger portion of scripture, uh, but before I do that, I just want to share with you um, something that was catalytic to me focusing in on this text, but also the series that we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks, which I call The Mystery of Christmas. And the church uh, blessed Carmen and I to go uh, for a pastor's appreciation to Branson. Carmen had been there before. I had never been to Branson. And and so we enjoyed the weekend immensely. And it came at a a perfect time where Carmen and I needed just some R&R. And the church uh, put us in great accommodations. and, And they also purchased some tickets for us for two shows. And one of them, one of the shows, was to the Sights and Sound Theater, and their mission statement is, is uh, the way they put it in expressing their vision is making the Bible come to life. And we just happened to be there the week that they started their Christmas presentation that was called The Miracle of Christmas. And uh, if you ever have the opportunity to go, because they, they've done Noah, they've done Samson, uh, they, they've done Moses, and so we had the opportunity. They just started the miracle of Christmas, and it was, it was nearly sold out. Three shows a day, theater seating, 2,000 people. It was packed, jam. And what that did to me when I sat there and watched uh, this drama, and, and when they begin the show, they tell you, we have tried to be so faithful with the biblical narrative. We want to be biblical. But we also know that many of the biblical narratives, they're very abbreviated, and we only get small glimpses into the story. So maybe it's one line that we hear Joseph say, or two or three lines that Mary say. But they say that what we've done is developed a personality for these biblical characters. And uh, with the script, we, we, we've given them language to articulate their emotions and their thoughts. And they said, we tried to be as, as loyal to the biblical story as possible, but we also have uh, some license to, to make these characters come to life. And while I was uh, watching this show, and I had known this, you know, intellectually, but it started to hitting me more emotionally because they showed how that the events, the intervention of God to bring his purpose to bear in the earth, in the miracle of the incarnation, it had a disruptive impact on the life of Mary and Joseph. And so what we do is we take these texts and when we read them, we read them with perfect hindsight. So our vision is 2020. We know that Mary is not stoned as an adulteress. We know that Joseph does not divorce a Mary. We know that there is finally a place, even though it's a manger where Jesus is born because there was no room in the inn. But, but when you're watching it as a drama for not the first time, but, but it became more real to me when I was watching the perplexity, the complexity, the discomfort that God was willing to bring about in their life so that their life could have a greater significance interfaced and engaged in the will of God. And I find that, that in our own lives, we all want to have greater vision. We all want to have greater faith. We want to live for God's highest purpose and God's greatest glory. And so the cry of our heart is we pray these dangerous prayers and we say, God, increase my faith. I want greater faith. I want greater vision. I want a greater purpose to, to be realized in my life. And, and Lord, I want your greatest glory to be reflected through my life. And can I say this? When you say those type of prayers, they are dangerous prayers to pray before a God that is willing 
for your growth and for your development and for your maturity, he's willing to allow you to be placed into seasons of great discomfort and, and complexity in your life. Okay, so let's read this text. It says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Now, I want to pause there and just teach just for a moment. You know, I've, I've been in charismatic, spirit-filled circles for the majority of my ministry, and, and there are seasons in my walk with God where I've so appreciated the prophetic, when I have really needed a word from the Lord in season, and there's nothing like it when you're saying, God, I, I really need you to break in, and I need to hear with clarity and confirmation what you're doing in my life. And there have been what I call prophetic scenarios where God put me in the right place at the right time and, and God gave me relevant, you know, preceding prophetic insight in the times and the season of my life, which was so critical. And it, it was a great encouragement for me. But I had a tendency sometimes at the level of my maturity that I was walking in that I was editing the prophetic words while they were being given to me. And by that, I mean that when I heard certain spiritual buzzwords that I valued and I appreciated more than other parts of the prophetic word, that I was willing to embrace them readily. And that was somewhat the only part of the word that I wanted to hear and that I could hear. And so like when Mary hears the angel say, greetings, O highly favored one of God. How many of you, if you have an angelic encounter, you want the first words of the, out of the angel's mouth to tell you how favored you are in the eyes and the sight of God? And for some of us, when we got those prophetic words, when it was like the Lord is going to bless you and there's a coming, coming season of fulfillment in your life, or however the prophetic word came out over you, sometimes we are very selective in our editing and we go words like favor, words like fulfillment, words like greatness, words like blessing, and we filter it through the words that only we value and appreciate in the moment. But I want you to continue to read with me and see that the angel was going to share some things that was wrapped up in paradox and mystery, and it grew her, uh, blew her grid. I don't believe that Mary, even though she was hearing the words of the angel about you know, you're going to give birth to the Son of God and that he's going to be, you know, in David's seat as king over Israel. You know, I think she was going, what are you saying? So in my own life, I have filtered my prophetic words and circled and highlighted the words I liked. But when it said that there is also going to be a season of testing, or there's going to be a season of stretching, and, and God is going to walk you through the fire. It's like, I didn't hear about the canyon of fire. Amen. I, I didn't hear about, you know, though you walk through the waters, Lynn, you won't be drowned. All I could hear is, I'm not going to be drowned. I wasn't thinking to survive drowning, you have to have a near drowning experience. So it says, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give 
to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, and I loved her simplicity because it was like, great. You know, she could have said, great, bring it on, God. But she just introduces right away, and she goes, how can this be? I'm not married. I've never known a man. So what you're saying to me is really an impossibility. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. The angel doesn't back off in any way. Matter of fact, he begins to just press in on the process of how God will begin to bring about this miracle, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. Look, or behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. So, when God comes to us many times, and when, when he wants to bring greater faith, vision, purpose, glory in our life, he will invite us into arenas that are outside our previous experience. He will bring us into arenas that he is bringing us into areas that are unknown to us. When God invites us into deeper levels of intimacy and relationship, this is what I found out. There is always mystery to what he's inviting us into. Sometimes it can be incomprehensible to us. Your previous experience will not help you where he is taking you. All of the previous experiences that you've banked and you've allowed that experience to be a teacher and a framework for your life experience, when you have Kairos moments where God breaks in and he answers dangerous prayers that you have prayed where you've said, God, take me deeper, take me further, take me into the greater. There will always be this breaking in of the mystery of God's will into the unknown where you've never gone before. Now, for most of the church in the West, What we want to do is we want assured outcomes, guaranteed outcomes. We want to make sure that what God is inviting us into keeps the boxes that we've made for God intact, right? We want to make sure that that no grid gets blown, that everything that we have known up to this point in time, that it doesn't disrupt what makes us feel comfortable, and we call them comfort zones, thoughts, patterns of living, lifestyle, habits. We become routinized in how we live, and it gives us a sense of safety and security. But God wants to challenge the church in the West to get over how much we have idolized and emphasized our intellect and our ability to to know the need to know that I've got to know what you're doing, God, before I obey you, before I launch out into this place of the unknown something that I may not be able to understand, but this is where the church is at in the West. We have said, God, unless we are fully informed, we cannot obey. We have based our faith upon the information that we feel that we need before we're willing to take any risk. It is so true. 
And God is going to come to the church and he is going to invite us back into what is a huge part of our faith and mystery is a huge part of our faith. How I many you know God is a God who is making himself known, but yet he is unknowable? That no matter how much you are leaning in to, to know God more deeply and more intimately, there will always be more of God that you don't know than the part of God that you do know. And so all of us, I feel like when I, when I share this message, all of us, We pray these dangerous prayers, and some of them are above the spiritual checks that we can write because we say we want greater vision, greater purpose. We We want to embrace greater glory, God. Increase my faith. Take me there, God. And God says, okay, are you willing to embrace the unknown and the mystery of the faith? I went to a, took some teenagers, and this was probably about 10, 15 years ago, but I took some teenagers to acquire the fire, and Ron Luce established uh, this ministry, and they would do these major regional conferences, and there was about 10,000 teenagers that I survived over a weekend, <laughs> and it was always a great experience, but there's nothing like having 10,000 kids worshiping Jesus passionately. And, and getting great content. But one of the things I'll never forget is Ron Luce was wanting to talk about, about how we, we need to be aware of certain portions and parts of the earth where there's very little gospel truth that is available to them. And so what he did, here we were in this big arena, and so what they did was they raised the stage door, side door, and here came this dump truck that came, and this dump truck was loaded with bread. And I don't know what bakery or what company he got a hold of, but it was a dump truck that was loaded with bread. And what he did was he had this back, uh, uh, um, dump truck back up, and he said, now I want to show you, and he had one loaf, and he said, I want to show you uh, what the, the 1040 window, how much of the gospel through broadcast, through literature, through radio, through television, uh, through uh, Bibles that are printed. He said, I want to show you how much of this information is available to those that live in the 1040 window. And he didn't just take one loaf. He took one slice of bread out of the loaf and he pinched off just a very small piece. And he said, this is the availability of the truth and the information and the word of God that's available to all those millions that live in the 1040 window. And so it was stunning and shocking. And then he took and he folded the rest of the bread and he said, now in, in the rest of Asia, this half of piece of bread. He goes, this is what's available for large portions of Asia. And then he took a part of the loaf and he said, now when you look at South America and the continent of Africa and Australia, he said, now we're getting to the larger parts. And so now we have an entire loaf. And then what he did was he, he told the truck driver, he said, now, he said, I want you to dump the bed. And he just dumped all of this bread out of the back of this dump truck. And he said, this is all of the gospel material broadcast, radio broadcast, television broadcast, internet broadcast, written literature, publishing of all the Bibles. He goes, this is what's available for America and Canada. You say, well, what's your point, Lynn, in this illustration? For some reason, believers in the West, we love to absorb massive amounts of spiritual information, but you would think that with the amount of what's available to us, that we would have a superior level of obedience 
and a greater level of faith when it comes to walking out God's greater vision and purpose in our life. You would think with what's available to us and all that we can absorb that is readily available to us that we would be the church that is setting an example for the rest of the world. But there is a disparity and a disconnect from what we have received and our willingness to apply what we know. And so information does not always equate to greater faith. And most of us, and this is an ouch moment that I'm going to say, most of us are way more educated above the level of our current obedience. We know things, but we're not applying them regularly in our life. But yet we read about examples of of Chinese believers in underground churches that have taken and they've taken that one Bible that they have and they have carefully disassembled it and handed it out to the members of the church and the, the, the congregation will pass these little leaves and pages around until they memorize the entire passage. And once the entire Bible is memorized by that house church or that underground church, they will not throw the leaf away. They will physically eat it and digest it because they respect the Word of God so much, they could not imagine throwing it away. But they know that if there is physical evidence of them possessing a Bible, it could mean a prison sentence to them. So they have literally fulfilled what it means to put the Word of God inside of them. Many of them live that way. And so, with all of our our glut of spiritual information, teaching that is available to us, many of us will not embrace mystery in our faith if it can't be explained to us, if it cannot be comprehended, if it is not knowable by our natural senses, we're unwilling to say yes to God. So the purpose of this message, and and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to teach about why God invites us to embrace mystery, but I want to first, in this message, get us comfortable with being uncomfortable. I want us to, to be able to learn to not stress when we're perplexed or when things look a little complex and we don't know assured or guaranteed outcomes, but we learn to enter into the mystery of the unknown and we know that God is able to take us there. One of the things that I shared at Dave Dostal's Celebration of Life is I was sharing out of Psalms 23 and it said, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. That phrase is a treasure to the people of God. It, 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 it comforts, it strengthens the people of God. But why is it such a comfort to us? Because we know someone that's gone to literally hell and back, death and back. So he knows the way where we do not know the way. Jesus said, I want your hearts not to be troubled. If, if you believe in God, believe also in me. In my, where I'm going, in my Father's domain, there are many places, and I go to secure one of those places for you. And one of the disciples, after he said that, said to him, how are we going to know where you're going, and how will we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you, if you believe in the Father, believe also also in me. And so, the one who is the resurrection and the life, the one who is the conqueror over death, conqueror of hell, he is the one that has gone through the valley of the shadow, the deepest valley of the darkness of death, and he knows the way through, and he knows the way back, so that when I have to walk that valley, my shepherd will shepherd me through that valley. 
It's a valley unknown to me. It's a, it's a dark, mysterious valley. I've never walked this way before. But yet, if the Lord knows the way, because of his experience, he can get me through the valley to the other side. Amen. So, why is it that we are so uncomfortable with being uncomfortable? When in fact, for greater vision and greater glory, God says, if you want to go deeper and if you want to grow and mature so that my purpose in your life can fully come forth, you've got to allow me to put you in a place of discomfort. Matter of fact, when I was watching that dramatic fashion, it it just hit me. It stunned me. It's like, God, do you even know what you put Mary through? What, what it must have been for Joseph to wrestle and agonize. And the Bible tells us that he, he was trying to find a way to discreetly end the relationship and divorce her and put her away. Can you imagine how many sleepless nights that man had? To think of this plan that he had of a life with Mary and how God so quickly was willing to just drop in with an angelic visitation and say, Mary, you're highly favored. Guess what? I'm going to interrupt your life, but the outcome is going to be real good. But you're going to not really know what I'm doing until I'm finished. Amen. As American Christians, we go, God, are you kidding Don't you know I have some definitions of what success are? Don't you understand that I've got a reputation to defend? Don't you know that I've worked on trying to find my identity only to have you shake what I thought my identity was and is? God says yes. Because God is more interested in our growth and the revelation of his glory and purpose in our lives and our comfort in our definition of success. He's willing to allow you to be misunderstood, perplexed, uncomfortable, to work something greater in you. Now, if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. James Richardson is here this morning, and we met for lunch about three weeks ago. Could have even been a month ago. And uh, we get together and share spiritual notes, what God is speaking to each other, and we compare spiritual notes. And he had read a book that was on a reading list by Ken Roberts, and that book was called Falling Upward. And uh, I believe the man is a a Franciscan monk. And so I'm going to just give this disclaimer. I didn't necessarily agree with everything in the book, but there was very many rich truths and treasures that I appreciated in that book. I just also just loved the title, Falling Upward. How many of you go higher? Many times the Lord has to take you to a place of humility that you've never known, that you understand that God is bigger than your intellect. God is bigger than your boxes. God is bigger than the, how you've tried to define your identity and your reality. And, and so in the book, he lays out this idea of the goal of God is to get us to really the second half of life. And he talks about how that if we don't get on to the second half of life, that we stay, and this is my language, not his, but we stay in a state of perpetual infancy. We actually stay and, and we embrace a spiritual dwarfism that we, we are stunted. And he said that if you don't allow God to take you deeper into the second half of life, you end up being a narcissist. Wow. That Ultimately, you, you end up and you, and you built this construct for your identity, and it's all about the external and what people can do for you instead of you actually being filled with the fullness of Christ, which we are blessed to be a blessing and we live to give, right? Yeah. And so he said it's very important. And so he talks about how in the first half of life, it, it is an important step where we, 
where we grow and, and we become independent from our parents and, and we, we, we try to say, I'm not them anymore. And as we say, I'm not them anymore, we try to find a place of identity. And so whether it's, you know, identify with this sports team, go pack, go. Or whether I join this fraternity or I educate myself to have this type of career. But he says all of those things of, of your, your affinities and, and, and your sports teams and, and, and your hobbies and all those things and your job and your degree and your education, that's all an external container. And he said most people spend their life trying to decorate this cup and they will paint it and repaint it and they will try to to reshape it and remold it, but they spend their entire life on the externals and they never worry about what God wanted to fill that with. Amen. And so he said that when we, when we begin to move beyond just the externals, we begin to say, God, you, 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 you created me in your image. You are now wanting me to to, to be filled with that glory, to be filled with Christ. But he made this profound statement. And I see that this is a gateway to greater faith. This helps me embrace the mystery of God, to be willing to allow God to take me to places unknown. He said, true spiritual maturity and growth is more about unlearning in the second half of your life what you really thought you knew in the first half of life. I want you to hear that again. Spiritual maturity and true spiritual growth is more about unlearning what you thought you really knew. I thought that would get a little more of an amen than that. (laughs) This is where I had a father in the Lord who was a professor of Bible college. He said, if they remain silent, even after you ask them to amen you, you are on thin ice, skate quickly. (laughs) Let's read this, Matthew chapter 18. He said, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So with that question that the 12 that were chosen by Jesus, with them asking this question of Jesus, were they focused on the first half of life or the second half of life? They were focused on the first half of life. They were still trying to find themselves, find their identity. And so it wasn't enough to be chosen by Messiah. It wasn't enough to be 12 men that were chosen to be with him, to live with him, to walk with him, to observe his ministry and his life. But they have an agenda for further definitions because they need to know. I need to know. I need to know. Am I more than just one of the 12? I need to know if I've made the top three. Isn't it amazing? I need to know that I'm number one. There's you, and then there's going to be a number one beside you. I need to know, am I the one that's going to be the number, your number one, your right-hand man? Because I want you to know, I've been observing this guy that I've been sleeping beside out in the Judean wilderness, and I I want you to know, if you think that he's number one, he's got some great qualities, but I know some things about him that probably, since since I sleep beside him in this big discipleship slumber party, there's some things that you need to know about him. Do you realize how bad his breath is? He could not be your emissary, your ambassador in your kingdom to be your number one representative. Are you kidding me? So here they are focused upon the outside, upon pecking orders, and they have to know how this is all going to work. And you know what? If they don't get this information, then guess what they're going to do? listen here, I need to know whether I'm number one because if I'm not number one, I'm going to reconsider me being a part of the 12. 
You know, I'm not just going to walk around here everywhere you go with all these mobs, people. It's hot out here. I'm not, it's hard work, hard work feeding these people to don't bring sack lunches. Are you kidding me? I will have to, you know, I have a limited time in a window. If I'm not going to be used for maximum potential, I've got to reconsider me serving in the 12. And so Jesus, what he does, and it's amazing how much time we waste trying to find out what we think that we want to know, and we miss the obvious. We miss the true. We miss the genuine. We miss the greater. And so Jesus, calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, so here they have this apostles, disciples, you know, business meeting where they're going to bring this agenda to Jesus to get the pecking order, order mixed out. And there have been people that are, that are outside the perimeter watching. And I love what Jesus does. He takes that which is outside of their focus and their interest those things that they should be perceiving and connecting to, relating to, discerning and perceiving and having eyes that see and ears that hear, but they're oblivious to those that are on the outside of the circle and Jesus has to refocus them by taking a child who is relegated to being on the outside, unimportant to this meeting, Come on, somebody shout me down because I'm preaching better than you're amening me. Many times the church gets focused on such small smallness and small priorities that we miss the greater glory of a greater vision. And I love it while we're pushing our agenda to, to, to get some title or to, to have some definition of the outside container. Jesus comes and he brings to us a greater vision by bringing something from the outside and setting it right in our midst. Yeah. I've seen churches do it time and time again where we start focusing on the trivial uh, that, those things that will not mean or have a long-lasting effect, we focus on those things that are temporal, and we get our eyes off of that which is eternal. So we constantly have to say, God, let's not focus on the externals. It's not about the externals. It's about what you're wanting to fill the cup with, the container with. So Jesus brings this child and he sets them in the midst and he said, I wonder if you've missed this. Truly, if anything is true, this is true, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children. Now, the first thing he said that to become like a child you first have to turn. This is the concept of repentance, that we are so focused on our way. We're so focused on our thoughts. We're so focused on our agenda, on, on where we're going, that we repentance means God causes us to see that we're missing it, and we have to turn. So, when the Pharisees came to John the Baptist... And they said, hey, what are you doing out here in the wilderness? He told them, he said, I want you guys to know, unless you show a, a, a fruit that is worthy of repentance, he said, you're going to perish. Judgment's on the way. And he said, God wants to, to see a fruit that comes from a deep work of repentance. I think the Western church, until there is a great turning in our attitudes and, and the constructs of our thinking and, 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 and how we drive agendas around the temporal and the temporary and what we define as success, until we start turning away from those things, we're not going to see what God is putting in our midst. So instead of me, Jesus said, you got to turn and become like a child. I'll never become like a child until I turn away from being adult. And adults think their, their, their experiences define reality. 
we think that we know everything about everything. So when I, as, a, as a leader, I try to talk to people sometimes when they're in crisis, and I try to bring counsel to them. And one of the things that I know, whether I can help somebody or can't help somebody, by what they say to me, if they say, I know, I know, I know. If they say to me, I know, then I go, well, I hope that works out for you. I can't help you. But obviously, there's something that you don't know, because if you knew it, you wouldn't be here. So I find that there is this turning. So I want to share with you, I'm I'm going through a deep season of brokenness and repentance where God is is turning me. And one of the areas that he's turning my heart is to be a better husband to my wife. Now, my wife is a consummate great one in the kingdom. I could not have asked for a better helpmate Uh, someone who serves. She has served me. She served our family. She served multiple congregations as I've pastored. And and she just loves well. She loves skillfully. But we went through this disorienting time with my my parents in the cell of our house to try to accommodate my parents. And she was uprooted. and, And so there was some emotional pain that she walked through. But also I noticed that Carmen going through, you know, her age stage, I noticed that Physically, she didn't have the stamina and the energy level that she used to have. And I noticed that she started having some back issues and she had some other medical issues. And, and you know, without complaint, she's not a complainer. But I just noticed that, that it was like, oh man, God, don't you let her break down on me. That, that was kind of my first reaction. Oh, God, don't let her break down on me. And then the Holy Spirit, and sometimes men have to be hit up beside the head with the Holy Spirit too before. Yeah. And this is what it sounded like. Thud! Thud! Because <laughs> sometimes God has to hit me a number of times. And the Holy Spirit said to me, You're praying the wrong way. You're praying a self-interested prayer. You're focused upon what she needs to be to you. No, this is about you coming into a, a greater arena, being a greater husband that has a greater vision, that has a greater compassion, that has a greater level of, of love for your wife. Amen. And so I've just been walking around with, because this is what true repentance is. True repentance, there's a level of godly sorrow over what you have neglected and what has been undone in your life and relationship. And so, I've been on this thing where, God, I want to demonstrate the fruit of repentance by me being a servant to her and looking for ways in which I can serve her and help her and support her. Because I know in Genesis, it's explicitly said that Eve would be the helpmate for Adam. But you know what? If it's good for one, just because it's not explicitly stated, the vision of marriage is that both husband and wife are helpmates to each other. And sometimes we only read it. Well, this is this is this says Eve, and she will be a helpmate. Well, what are we what are we missing? Where are we missing out on the second half of that? It's implied that Adam would then be a helpmate for his wife. And so yesterday we had all of our family because Jesse and Molly are in from Uganda and this was our time to convene and have our Christmas. And so yesterday we fed, I think it was 14, 15 people. And uh, so it was on like Donkey Kong. And I, I, because this is getting deeper in me, I want to be a greater husband. I want to have a greater vision. I want to reflect a greater glory of Christ loving the church and laying down his life. And, and the reason why I just had a, a mature, immaturity for many years in, in which I, w- I because I, I, I was pastoring and pastoring is labor intense. Sometimes I would just come in and it was like, I have nothing else to give. And so I used the church as, a, as the great excuse right. for my absence in serving my wife. 
And so my first reaction, like I said, was God instantly healer for my sake. (laughs) Instead of God having to hit me and saying, no, how about I heal her, but in the process of her healing, how about you standing up and being the man I always wanted you to be and loving her like she should be loved? How about nurturing more? How about cherishing more? How about valuing her at an even greater way? So I was up yesterday morning, and I mean, I I went on it. We went on a tear, and I, I was cooking, and I was preparing the meal, and we were peeling potatoes, and we were, I was basting a ham. I mean, I had to be ambidextrous to do it all, and I even sent her on an errand to get her out of the kitchen, and and I wanted her to go just briefly for maybe an hour, but she took her mom, and it ended up being two hours, and she had a recipe on her phone, and I started to panicking. It's like, so I called her. I said, I wanted you to go, but I didn't want you to take the whole afternoon because stuff's cooking, and I don't know what to do. (laughs) So then last night, you say, what are you telling this? Because I'm telling you, God, I have all this experience. I have 29, 28, 29 years of what it means to be married to Carmen. But I want God to take my relationship with her into beyond my experiences, into realms of the unknown where God can bring me into a dimension of relationship with her that I've never known. Amen. So last night she came up. And I was rereading my notes and and just prayerfully praying over today. And she came in. She goes, I want you to know I am so grateful and thankful for all the work that you did today. And, and, And you stayed in after the cooking and you washed the dishes and I didn't have to do anything. And she goes, I'm just overwhelmed. And I looked at her and I said, oh, no. You don't have to thank me. I said for years. I've been that guy sitting in the couch watching the football game while you have been carefully, skillfully loving our family. And I said, I repent for how I have neglected to serve you and love you the way Christ loves the church. So sometimes what we have to do is we have to unlearn what we know so God can reteach us things that he needs us to know in the second half of life. And I know that in the second half of life, it's about me understanding what is truly valuable and what's not valuable. And I know Jesus is not going to ask me when I stand before him, how many sermons did you preach in your ministry? (laughs) Won't even be a question that he'll ask me. Even if I had it all out in a notebook, well, you know, I preached 5,267 and a half sermons. And the half was because they actually got up and left and would not allow me to finish. Impressive, wasn't it, Jesus? He'll say, what did you tell them? What did you say to them? That's more important. Did did you actually love people? Did you actually care for them? Or was it about you just functioning in your gift and being impressive? Now I tell you, the ways of God, the thoughts of God are so far superior than the way most of us think. So 
I want to encourage us. Because many times we go, experience has taught me. Experience can teach you, but experience can become a trap. Because your limited experience can make you think that you know all there is to be known. And this is what I do know. The more I walk with Jesus, the less confident I am in the things that I think I know. But I'm learning to get comfortable with not having to know it. Because if I know him, I know that he knows it. And again, it's not even my faith, but it is my faith in his faith. I want you to stand with me.